Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Who's ever built a house, like built a house from scratch? So, yes, so there's quite a few of you. So quite a few of you will understand this whole concept. Today's message title is called Solid as a Rock. And now I know there's probably a lot of you that have heard uh, messages about building on solid foundations and all that sort of stuff, but today you're going to hear it again. And the reason why is that I feel that God's placed something upon my heart for us to continue to build in our lives. I had a friend of mine down in, in Melbourne and he, um, he decided to go ahead and build his own house. And what he did is he employed the services of his father, who actually lived next door. And his father was a commercial builder. So he had worked on uh, you know, high-rise buildings and so forth and, and was one for, for details. One of the things that his name was Abraham. And one of the things that as I was speaking to Abraham, I asked him about you know, the process of pouring the slab and being a concreter and so forth. I was quite interested in that. And I said, so how thick, how thick are we going on the, on the slab? And he said, oh, it's about you know, 200, 250 millimetres. And I said, he goes, but I'll do mine at 400. I said, oh, why is that? And he goes, well, I want to get down to the bedrock. And, and so there was a big belt of uh, granite that goes through that, that particular block. And so the excavation start, they start p- pulling out all the dirt and all the rocks and, and all of that sort of stuff. And then they get down to the bedrock. And as soon as he got to the bedrock, which is like a hardened basalt, he kept going. He kept going and he pulled more rock out, more rock out, more rock out. And then by the time that he had finished, he, his slab that he was pouring for his concrete was going to be sitting right on top of the bedrock. He then decided to get big hammer drills and drill into the bedrock, connect it with steel reinforcement. And then from there, he decided to do his concrete slab, his concrete foundations. Now, I can guarantee you that when Jesus comes and the whole earth shakes, that house will still stand. (laughs) I can guarantee it. That house will still stand. See, Abraham's thought in his mind, he was a good, good Christian guy. He thought that the deeper I go, the more solid my foundations I know that this house is not going to move. He knew that if he was able to put his foundation on top of a additional foundation, that it wasn't going to move. Jesus in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 and 48 does touch on this. It says this, So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone listens to me and listens to my teaching and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundations on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without any foundation. When the flood sweeps down against that house it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Jesus' instruction to us there was to dig deep. Dig our foundations deep. You could almost take the illustration which he used in the verses above it, where it talks about the tree that produces good fruit. See, a tree that produces good fruit has roots that go very, very deep into the soil because it has to gain all the nutrients out of the soil to then produce good fruit. See, one of the uh, illustrations that was given to me when I was when I was a little bit younger was you can only go as high as you can or the tree will only go as high as it can. If the roots go as low as it can. It's the same as the foundations of a building. You can't build a skyscraper on a 200 millimeter thick concrete slab. You have to build a skyscraper on foundations that go up to 50 meters deep. I'm not sure if you're aware of the, the, um, the tallest building in the world is called the, the one in Dubai. Yeah, the Burj Khalifa. 
Um, that one uh, is the tallest building in the world. It took six years to build and just to get out of the ground, so to get from the bottom foundations to ground level took 1,325 days. It sits, it sits upon 192 concrete steel, uh, concrete reinforced piles that are driven 50 metres into the ground. Now they go down to 40 metres to get to the bedrock and then they went another 10 metres into the bedrock to anchor this building. Now engineers had to then think about it very differently because as soon as they went up, they realised that they had to contend with um, atmospheric change, wind and all of that sort of thing. If the foundations were out by five millimetres, that was their tolerance. If they were out by five millimetres across the whole base of that building, that building would have looked like the Leaning Tower of Pisa and would topple over. Five millimetres down the bottom, that's that much. Because as it went up, it would have gone out on an angle. See, the foundations of our Christian life are the same. See, when we build foundations as Christians, we actually have to build it upon something solid. We are called the temple of the Lord. So we actually have to build our life on solid foundations. Our foundations have to go deep. Our foundations have to be based in truth and not in what the world tells us. Hebrews 6 verses 1 to 2 talks about what our foundations actually are. So that's Hebrews 6, 1 to 2. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptism and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. They're our basic foundations of our Christian faith. Repenting, repentance, placing our faith in God, baptism, the laying on of hands for healing, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment of God. As Christians, they're our foundations. As Christians, we understand that we have to live our life according to these principles. They're just the basics. But what happens in our life is that we are called to not just stay where we started. Our call is to what? Mature. Our call as Christians is not just to remain where we were 20 years ago, but to continue to move forward in our understanding and our desire to pursue God. See, if we're the same person that we were 20 years ago, we haven't matured in any way. There's still the foundations of who we are, but we should continually be maturing, continually be challenging ourselves and our faith to grow in God and, and grow in our understanding of who he is. See, sometimes we build our, our house or we build our foundations and they can be a little bit dodgy. They can be a little bit corrupted with, with certain things. Again, I'm gonna go back to my, my building analogy for a second. If there was any contaminants within a concrete slab or any foundations of any kind, it then actually undermines the entire slab. If the steel reinforcement that is in there contains rust, can contaminate this foundation itself because it can eat away inside the concrete. What Christ is calling us to do and what the word calls us to do is constantly examine our own life. It's called self-awareness. Christ is constantly saying, check yourself, search your heart, search your life and make sure that our lives are lining up with scripture. I know that I've been on a journey myself of understanding what are some of the things that I was raised with and that I thought were the, the non-negotiables. As I search scripture and as I pursue God with an intent to do so, my viewpoints are shifting or I'm starting to wrestle with those things. It's not that I'm, I'm moving constantly away from them and that's not what I'm promoting here, but I'm, constant, I'm constantly wrestling with different ideas and thoughts about who God is and his nature. 
What is his outcomes for us? What is his purposes for us? See, if we build our lives upon poor foundations, what happens is, is over time, it might, sustain, it might be sustainable for some period of time. But over time, it'll fall away. One of the things we, we do as, as churches, and if you run a business, it's the same thing. It's called culture. You want to build a culture in your organisation or in your church that are based on good, solid principles and foundations. See, if, if the, the foundations or the culture of your organisation or your church aren't based on solid things and they're not something that people can grab onto and tangibly work through each and every time they come to work or they come to church, it will ultimately topple over, topple over because there is no solid foundation that ties them to it. Those things are called values. Those things are called culture. It's also another word that we can use is vision. We want to we wanna make sure that people have something to hold on to. If our businesses or our organisations aren't based on good, solid values, then they will topple over. Every house that gets built looks different. But all of the foundations should be the same. So each and every one of us in here, we are all built differently. And if you call Christ your saviour, we are all should have the same foundations. Those foundations should be those things that we talked about earlier, but then we're looking to build upon them. We're looking to expand them, develop them, promote them, disciple our kids and others in those areas. But there's one thing, there's one important ingredient that is needed before the actual building goes up. And you'll find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. I think it's from verse 19, but that's okay. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Our foundations are to be based on truth, the truth out of Hebrews chapter 6. But Christ is our cornerstone. It is the stone, it is the point in which we set our lives off. Now, we sing about that song, Cornerstone. You've probably heard the term cornerstone many times. If you've been a Christian for many years, you might have heard the term quite a few times in your journey. I had as well, but I had no idea what it meant. And so what it was is the cornerstone was the, where you would lay your foundation. So back again, I'm going to go back to my building analogy here, but if you had um, laid a foundation, they didn't have concrete back in those days, so you just had to dig down to bedrock and then you had to lay your first first piece of stone. All the stones weren't made out of timber, they were made out of like um, stone or masonry. And you'd then set your first keystone in place and what that then did was that was the that was the marker of everything that was going to be horizontally level and vertically plumb so if your first stone that went in was off so was the rest of the building so if it wasn't flat that way perfectly the house would go downhill or uphill depending if it wasn't plumb Going that way, the house kicked out on a lean. As we build on top of foundations, as Christians, Paul's saying, Christ is our starting point. This might be new to some and it might be fairly old. I've heard this before. But that's what maturity is. See, maturity as Christians is, again, God's constantly calling us to mature. And sometimes that we need to then revisit some of those key foundations in our life. At the moment, we've, and we've sort of come to the end of our, our discipleship, uh, the pursuit, which has been our, our discipleship uh, series that we've gone through as a, as a church. The thing that I've loved about the pursuit in itself is that there is such 
uh, truth. And some people thought, oh, it's quite, bas it's quite basic. A and I was less like, absolutely. The gospel isn't complex. Sometimes we've, we've, we've made the gospel really complex. And we get bogged down in doctrine and, and theology and all of those sorts of things. And what we desired as a church is that we continue to build upon the layers of the foundations of the scriptures. See, discipleship in that, in that way is something, a way that we can constantly mature because we can go back and reflect where we are. We can go back to our key cornerstone, which is Christ, and say, hey, am I off here? Am I off there? Is there a way that I've sort of maybe just maybe I've laid a few other stones next to it but what's happened is I haven't got this quite right. I've based it on uh, a preacher or I've based it on a book. I've based it on something that I've heard, even a prophecy. But I haven't checked it against this. See, this here is our key cornerstone. See, we know Christ personally as a, as a relationship, but these are the guidelines. These are the, this is the formula of where and how we lay the stones in our life. So as maturing believers, there are certain things that we, we, we do. As, as to mature, there's certain things that we can do. Again, I just want to reemphasize that every house is different, but our foundations remain the same. First and foremost, I, I think that maturing believers are discerning believers. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 to 16 says this, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed around and blown by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Who's ever heard that? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I just want to highlight verse 14 for a, sec and for a second, and it says this, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever. They sound like the truth. Discernment, and I have mentioned this before, is not always just what's right from wrong. But discernment is sometimes the difference between what's right and what's nearly right. See, as maturing Christians, and notice I didn't say mature Christians because we never get to full maturity. We are maturing Christians. We are always maturing. We are always going on a journey where we're following and pursuing God. We never quite get to full maturity. But as maturing Christians, we are to be discerners. Now, I believe in this day and this time more than, I don't know if it's more than any time in history, but I know more than what I've been alive, discernment is key. Discernment and understanding what is truth and what is nearly truth is so important. There is so, there's so much on social media. There's so much in, on YouTube. You can watch a, a new preacher every week, for, uh, every day for a year and still not cover them all. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a new truth or a new revelation or a new way that they've expanded the word of God. We have to just be very, very important that we don't get caught up in the hype and we go back to the word of God. One of the things is, is when I get up here to preach, and I'm sure Mike does the same, is that we have to be very careful that what we say aligns with the Word of God. Because if it doesn't, we're in trouble. And so there's great responsibility for us to actually make sure that the Word of God is spoken and preached, not just our interpretation of what the Word of God says. See, the Word of God is what should be influencing our viewpoints, not our viewpoints influencing the Word of God. We should be reading the God and letting it wash over us, not looking for things that make an argument, that hold up to our point of view. 
That's how we should interpret the word of God. It should be washing over us. Matthew 7, talking about discernment, 15 to 23 says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way that they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't even produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't even produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree from its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. It's quite sobering. Quite sobering. Challenging and sobering. Many come in the name of God. Many come in the name of Jesus. They say all the right things. They do all of the right things to a point. And then they've led a whole group of people down a path of destruction. See, as maturing Christians, our challenge is to be able to discern what is right and what is wrong. The mark of a maturing believer, and this is from Charles Swindoll, says a mark of a maturing believer is to discern right from a wrong in an oversimplified way, saying, uh, saying discernment is knowing good from evil and having the self-control to respond accordingly. Let me read that again. Discernment is knowing good from evil and having the self-control to respond accordingly. A mature believer filters things through their minds and then the lens of scripture. If it doesn't add up, it's not right. We can only know what the Bible says. I know this is going to be a shocker, but we can only know what the Bible says when you read it. Clements mentioned it before. If we are living our Christian life and we don't know what it says in the Word of God, we will struggle to know who God is. We will struggle to understand truth. We will struggle to be able to discern right from wrong. I encourage every believer, everyone here who calls Christ their Lord and Saviour, make the reading of your Bible a daily principle. Not when you're feeling good, not when things are going great, a daily principle. And when we read it, read it with the intent that it speaks to us, not with the intent of us putting our lens through Scripture. Proverbs chapter 1 and verses 1 to 7 talks about discernment. The book of Proverbs is one of my favourite books of the Bible. I read a proverb a day. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. I read a proverb a day. And what we do is we read it with our boys. And the idea behind that is that the boys can start to understand what it means to be good young men, to have good principles in their life. If you want to understand the world, and if you want to understand how the world can have an effect in our life, and how we can resist such things, read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 1 to 7 says this, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, King David's son. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to teach them to do what is right, just and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young, and let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser, and those with understanding receive guidance. By exploring the meaning of these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. How 
how's everyone doing? <laughs> Some. I really believe that as, as we move further in our world today, that we have to be based and we have to be solid as rocks. Our foundations have to be solid. We can't afford to, be, to be, have one foot in and one foot out anymore. As Jesus said, those who call out to me, Lord, Lord, we did all of these things in your name. But what happened? They didn't fulfill the Father's will. I believe that we have all been called to fulfill the Father's will. We've all been called with a purpose. We've all been called with something in mind. God has placed a vision before each and every one of us. And as a church and as a gathering of people together, he's done the same. He's done it individually. He's done it for this local church. And he's doing it for the church as a whole. Last week I spoke about unity and unity in the church it requires humility, it requires sacrifice, it requires love. But I think it also requires us to continue to search out to mature, to grow, to not be content with where we are now. Never be content with where you are. Never be in a place of comfortability. I know that sucks, but that's, God doesn't want you in a place of being comfortable. God wants us in, to be in a place where we're constantly, constantly pursuing him. I had a chat with a guy throughout the course of the week, and I said one of the hardest things as a Christian, I believe, is discipline. The discipline to get your thoughts right, the discipline to get your actions right, the discipline to read your Bible, the discipline to pray, the discipline to love people. Disciplines are the things that hold us together. I think disciplines are incredibly important in our life. If we can learn to set aside or set things in place that bring us to a place of being focused, have discipline. I know the enemy will constantly try and weasel his way in through the smallest of cracks. We have to constantly be on guard, constantly. As a believer, there is a constant war that happens with our mind and with our spirit, in the flesh and in the spiritual. We live two worlds, spiritual and flesh, and the enemy will do everything that he can to weasel his way in when you've let your guard down. Our discipline and our, our struggle is that we have to be on guard the whole time. We don't actually have an opportunity to rest. As in, we can rest from a, in a physical nature. We can rest physically. That, that's a good thing. God says rest. But we have to be on guard constantly in our spiritual. Because if we're not, as soon as we get to a place where we feel like we're doing good, what happens? All of a sudden, it's just like, oh, I'm in a great place with God. I won't read mine today. I won't pray. I won't worship. I won't go and make that phone call. They're doing fine. But God's saying, no, be on guard. Our discipline will allow us to stay focused. Our discipline will be the mark of a mature believer. So how do we mature as a wrap up? Well, it starts by thinking beyond ourselves, being self-aware, but also not being selfish. Think beyond ourselves. For fear of sounding like a broken record, read your Bible, pray, but be in fellowship. See, iron sharpens iron as one friend sharpens another. Really important. Don't be isolated. Stay in fellowship. Stay together. <coughs> Discipleship. Mentorship. Our passion and our desire to do 
what we call the Top Gun program, which is our youth program, is to constantly disciple young men. We want to build men into the kingdom. We want men to be the very best that they can. We want that the same for women as well. But we feel like at the moment there is, a, there, is a, there is an attack on manhood. There's an attack on boys. There's an attack on those things. And they're not the things that we feel are godly. So discipleship. Get around and mentor. Get around and find someone who you can speak into, whose life you can speak into, who you can journey along with through the good times and the bad. If you have a mentor, great. If you don't, Come and ask. Come and speak to someone. Look for someone who holds the same values or the same principles. It could be around parenting. It could be around family or marriage. It could be around any part. It could be finances, business, anything like that. But with Christ as the chief cornerstone in every one of those areas, that's where maturity will come. That's where development will come. That's where fruit will be produced. If you want to get in and around a life group, Find a life group. We've got quite a few running across the place. Six or seven. Come and see me, Pastor Mike, Clarissa. Anyone on the team here would be happy to point you in the direction of a life group. Again, doing life together, iron sharpening iron. Believers becoming more mature in their their walk with Jesus. And another way that we can do this is maybe being part of a service team, if that's something that you desire. We have cafe, we have kids. You have service on team, welcoming. If there's anything, any area that you want to serve in, again, come and speak to us. There's opportunities across the board. Worship team. Now, if you can't sing or you can't play an instrument, it might be a bit difficult, that one. All right. I suppose I can't, so it's doing all right. The thing is, we can find places for us to serve. As Christians and as believers, we are called to live a life that honours God. We are called to live a life maturing, growing, producing good fruit. And that's what I believe our challenge is today, is not to stay content with where we are, but to continue to move forward. Begin here as you mean to go here. Wherever you want to get to, start with the principles in place back here. No point having great dreams and visions, but if you don't put the principles back here. Build that solid foundation. Reinspect your foundations. Reinspect what you've put your what you've laid your life on and what you've laid as a foundation. So I encourage you all in that today. Why don't we just bow our heads as we pray and finish this This morning, we're going to go and have coffee, spend some time in fellowship. Again, if you're new here, uh, we'd love to chat with you. You can can go to the Connect Point table. Let's take an opportunity to pray and just give this morning to to God. Lord, Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you want to come and meet us. It is by your mercy and by your grace that we have the the opportunity to come into a right relationship with you. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you help us to align our life with the cornerstone. That as Christ is our cornerstone, Lord Jesus, then that you you are the marking point in which we set our life off. We don't set our life off our own circumstances or our own knowledge or our own wisdom or our own understanding, Lord Jesus. We set it off you. Lord, challenge us each and every day to be disciplined. Not to allow our thoughts to wander. Not to allow our actions and our our opportunity to rest, allow us to drop our guard. But we stay ready united if you've um, if you've heard this message this morning this morning 
and you've never had the opportunity to ask Christ into your life, if you've never had the opportunity to know who Christ is, know who Jesus is, know who this person is, I'm going to stay out the front for a little bit. And if that is something that you would love to come and get a little bit more understanding and knowledge around, I'd love to have a chat with you. If you need prayer for anything else, I'm more than happy to stay out the front and have a chat with you and and spend some time in prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We pray that as we go and fellowship together, Lord Jesus, that you will produce good fruit, that you will continue to help us to mature in what you've called us to do. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and honour. In Jesus' name, amen.